Welcome everyone from around the world. Can you guys hear me? Jump on the chat and let, yes, Parth, thank you. Yes, 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 Nori, Charles, fantastic. Happy Friday, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we do have people here from all over, so this is very exciting. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here doing this with you guys. I think this is kind of a good time of year just to have a check-in about what's going on in the lay of the land. So welcome from around the world. Those of you that are not live are going to be able to watch this replay for about a week. So make sure you, you, you jump into it um, if you're not here live. And um, cool. All right. Everybody's there. Hey, everybody. So for those of you that don't know me, I'm going to do a little bit of a brief intro about who I am. I'll keep it moving quickly. And then we're going to get into some really awesome content in a second. My name is Joseph Perlman, and uh, I'm an acting and performance coach for Hollywood celebrities, musicians, comedians, actors. I help my clients launch their careers and reach Oscar potential on set. And I also coach presenters for all the major award ceremonies like the Oscars and the Grammys and the Emmys, etc. At my studio, and some of you guys are studio members, some of you guys are clients, some of you guys have heard about us who haven't worked with us yet, but we help actors launch their careers faster and reach Oscar potential on set. It's the most advanced training in the industry and we offer private classes and coaching from beginner to celebrity. What's cool about the classes is that the actors in our classes get to compete for new major film and TV roles every week. We strategize with some of those actors who have come through the career work with us to compete for those roles, essentially making getting in the room the easy part. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. We're the only studio that guarantees you get an audition win every time you walk into the room. And a win is obviously you book a role or you get a callback or a producer session or somebody, production, casting, falls in love with you, you're a problem solver, and they bring you back in over and over again until something really exciting connects and books. Uh, no scene partners. Our classes are small, and it's, it's an extension of our private coaching. So everyone who's in attendance um, right now is invited to attend a free audit in my master class. It's a small group of our celebrity series lead level actors, people like Nori, uh, Eugene, who's gonna be joining us in a little bit. So if you guys haven't done a free audit yet, you're invited to do that if you're in Los Angeles and we'd be happy to, uh, to welcome you. So let's see here. The other thing I do that I don't talk about too often is that I use the work that I do with actors, I work with world leaders, politicians, execs, lawyers, CEO, industry leaders to develop charismatic confidence within seconds to affect maximum change in their audiences and to help them grow their businesses faster. I've been lucky enough to work with people like uh, Doctors Without Borders and people doing TED Talks and making UN speeches. Recently coached a meeting, uh, can't talk too much about it, uh, for someone going in to meet with the Taliban, which is crazy using the, you know, using the acting work that we do. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I write for a variety of magazines, including Backstage and Inc. Let's talk about what we're going to do today, because talking about myself is not the most fun thing for me. I want to talk about how we can all help each other. So the first thing that happens in any of the classes at the studio is we have what's called an accountability part of class. I call it an accountability session with the actors who are at the studio. I wanna hear in this session how you guys are doing, what's new, is it busy, is it slow, what's 
going on in your world. It's an opportunity for, you know, the actors to check in. And sometimes there's some really exciting news. Sometimes something upsetting happened. But I'm going to kind of think about this webinar as a little bit like we're just kind of hanging out, decompressing a little bit as we're pushing into episodic season. So the webinar is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is a discussion of the title, win a series lead before it goes to casting. So how do we launch your career and compete for series leads or series lead level roles before they go to casting? And then we're going to be talking about the acting as I welcome special guest Eugene Simon, who some of you may know from Game of Thrones, among many other things, and talking about how we guarantee audition wins every time we walk into the room and reach Oscar potential on set. And so we're going to be welcoming Eugene probably in about 45 minutes or so. So I see some of you guys are coming online now. Just a reminder that you're going to be able to hi from Auckland, uh, hi from Texas. You guys are going to be able to watch this replay for a week. So here we go. So at the studio, uh, we coached 100 plus actors to booked roles this year alone and helped over 20 clients land series leads in major cable and network shows. Um, and also win leading and supporting in feature films as well. Oftentimes, without setting foot in a traditional casting environment, without a casting director present, and also oftentimes without the help of an agent or a manager. So this is where I want to check in with you guys and bring you up to speed and talk a little bit about sort of what we know, what's going on this year, the lay of the land, and some of the new things that are happening. So here's what we know. We know that it's not good enough to be it's not good enough to be good. You have to be great. Not enough to be good. You have to be great. Okay, this is the Olympics. It's the Olympic level of the game. So you want to be great. When you're great, there are no rules. So if there's anything that you guys leave today with is the concept of throwing away the throw completely burning the rule book what you think of as a right way or a wrong way to do something. It's completely been turned upside down. So there are no rules. Everyone is scared, not just actors, casting directors, writers, directors, producers, everybody is scared, which is the reason why you should come into these situations where you're meeting these people, casting or general meetings with production, coming in as a colleague, as an equal, as an equal player. Now, this is something that Eugene Simon, who I'm going to be welcoming up here uh, on, the, on camera in a little bit, it's a great quote of his. And he said, it doesn't get easier, you just get braver. Nothing gets easier, you just get braver. Braver in putting yourself out there to pitch yourself for roles. Braver in your acting choices. And then the other thing, too, is that if something is currently casting, it's too late to meaningfully compete for it without solid budding relationships uh, with major writers, directors, and producers. So if it's casting, it's too late without a solid pre and post game strategy to lay claim to any given major role. So what that means is this. When something's currently casting, when it's released on breakdowns, it's sort of like it's coming down an air conditioning shaft and it's like a feeding frenzy. You know, thousands or hundreds or more actors are competing for these roles. And if you don't have pre-existing relationships with the people who produce it, write it, direct it, if you don't have those pre-existing relationships, those irons in the fire, you're entering into an even bigger lottery when you go to those auditions that you're going to even get a producer session, that it's going to go to the next level. So 
it's it's kind of a must to have those relationships going into it. And we're going to talk about, you know, how that works and what that looks like. Over the last year and a half, about maybe two years, production has been sort of creeping in to casting, taking over a lot of casting. A lot of casting is going in-house to production offices for many reasons. One, I feel like a lot of casting has automated themselves out of work and production sees how easy it is to do it on their own and then they take it in-house. So what we're really talking about here is rejecting this model that I think a lot of folks out there believe is that the sort of key to a key to a career, the magic pill, the gatekeeper of your careers are casting directors, and they're not. They're an extremely important alliance to have, but in no way are casting directors ever the gatekeepers uh, to your career. Very, very important. Um, because casting directors don't cast actors. They bring a large group of actors, they whittle it down to a small group of actors, and they put that group in front of producers or writers or directors. Does that make sense? It's kind of funny, um, you know, doing these webinars, um, podcasts, because I'm so used to interacting uh, with people on a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. So it's going to be fun to have Eugene up here in a second. So um, there's a lot of information I want to impart because I think it's very important and it's going to help you. Um, so thank you guys for, you know, listening and, and uh, hearing me out here before I start interacting with Eugene. So if it's casting, you guys, it's too late without the solid pre and post game strategy. And over the last, I'd say about two years, production has been slowly taking over a lot of casting. That doesn't mean casting directors don't have work. Great casting directors who have phenomenal alliances with production companies still have just as much, if not more, work than they had. But a lot of casting directors have a lot less work. Then something that's really exciting that we talk about with regards to the acting is it's imperative that you let go of outcomes. When you get a role, whatever that role is, a booked role, an audition, you have to completely let go of your idea of who that person is, what you think that character is all about, the outcome. Does that make sense? Letting go of what you think that character is going to be because it's going to prevent you from discovering something amazing. And it's going to be what makes the performance look like everybody else's performance. It's going to be how you play the cliche of that role versus to create a surprising, making surprising choices with it. So letting go of outcomes. The other part of the audition process that we, we work with actors on at the studio is perhaps more important than the actual acting. It's something that a lot of people don't know is that who you are when you walk into the room is oftentimes more important than the actual acting that you ever do in the room. That's not to say the acting isn't important. It's really, it's really important. I'm trying not to curse here. I was going to say it's really fucking important. It's really fucking important. Um, but perhaps even more important is um, the moment you walk in the room is being prepared to be interviewed as you, who you are as a human being. And it's important not to invest in an acting preparation that suggests that you prepare for the start of your piece in the hall before you walk into that room. You're gonna miss the most important part, the interview of you. And there's three things that you need to establish when you walk into a room. Like, think of it like any situation, whether it's a job interview or a date or you know meeting with a new team, but we're talking about acting here. And it's important that you establish one, that you are going to be fun to play with, that you are a fun person to play with. Two, that you are someone that production personally likes. And three, that there's zero desperation. There's no desperation in the room. You don't want anything from anybody. 
You're walking into the room as a colleague, as an equal. This is something I recently worked on with a phenomenal actor and masterclasser, Nori, uh, who's here, who's here right now. We uh, we worked on a we worked on something like this a couple days ago. So I really want you guys to digest that for a, digest that for a second and think about who you are when you're walking in the room and how do you establish your fun to play with that you're someone that somebody can personally like and yeah and that you know you're going to you're going to you're coming in as a colleague and i think doing that is more about what you don't bring in the room than what you do bring in the room. We don't want to look like we're trying to do something. So that's also something that we help actors to develop at the studio in classes. In addition to working on currently casting auditions or booked roles, we can also work on how to prepare for a meeting, how to get yourself ready to walk into a room to be compelling within seconds as you, your personality. So now I want to dive into what the real subject is, the title of this webinar, which is how to win a series lead before it goes to casting. But to do that, I need to take you through a little bit of the story of this career work that I've been doing with actors for many years. Some years ago, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 years ago, I started noticing this, um, yeah, Nori, I'm glad you're telling everybody what that was about. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. You were signed by a huge uh, agency. I noticed a trend. Why are actors who are at their Olympic level, remember, it's not enough to be good. You have to be great. And why are actors who are approaching their Olympic level of the game who are great? Why are those great actors only going out for like zero to six major roles a year when there's like 50 to 100 roles out there for any given actor any year, why are great actors going out for nothing or six, zero to six roles? And I figured it out. I figured out what was going on. It's because um, their agents and managers that they were working with didn't know that it was their responsibility to pick up a telephone and pitch their clients for every role that they're right for, okay? And the exciting thing is this is possible to do with or without representation. The, one of the sort of common actor frustrations is this, and I hear this all the time, Joseph, I have reps, but they're doing nothing for me. Well, that's 99% of agents and managers out there. They're not gonna do anything for you because all they're doing is they're submitting you through breakdowns. It's like the equivalent of throwing a piece of gum on the wall over and over and over again in the hopes that one time it'll stick. And that's ridiculous. The 1% of agents and managers know that it is their job and their responsibility to pick up a telephone and make hundreds of phone calls a week for their clients to pitch them. And these phone calls are not just to casting, it's to producers, it's to writers, it's to directors, it's setting up general meetings with their clients that they go on. Um, so many pitches on average with probably maybe one of the highest level management companies, um, the people that represent Eugene and, and a bunch of other clients, people I've been working with for many years, describe that it takes up to 20 phone calls to secure a high level audition. Can you imagine how many submissions that would take? Thousands, hundreds. So yeah, and, and those phone calls help to set those little campfires in various offices, production, writing, casting, so that when you finally do get that audition, you are known by those people who actually create those projects before you go and audition. So the goal is to be familiar to production. You want to become familiar pro uh, to production. And you may, you may be asking, well, if um, I don't have a team yet, I don't have agents and managers yet, I don't have any major credits, how could I possibly do this? 
The good news is that you can. There's a right and a wrong way for actors to do it. It's, it's called value proposition. We're going to talk about it in a little bit. Um, one of my clients, uh, her name is Elena. Uh, she didn't have any major credits. This is a couple of years ago. She did some background work in House of Cards. Uh, she won a short film competition at a film festival. But we wove a lot of those things together and created a really compelling pitch uh, to pitch herself for a meeting with Wonder Woman director Patty Jenkins. And we got an amazing response uh, to that pitch. So it's important that you guys also stop looking for representation. That's a very, that, that's a big thing. I wrote an article on it for Backstage a couple of years ago. Stop looking for representation. Great representation is going to want to feel like they discovered you, that they came across an actor. There's a better way to trigger that happening than looking for representation. Um, a referral, uh, booking roles on your own before finding great representation. So one of our actors in Masterclass, Hugh Scott, super talented actor that some of you guys know, said some said a great quote. He said, if you're going to chase them to get signed, then you may be chasing them when you are signed. So if you're going to chase them to get signed, then when you are signed by these reps, you're going to be chasing them the same way that you were chasing them to get signed. All right, here we go. What happens when you're pitched via phone versus submitted? Pitched actors go to producer sessions. Submitted actors go nowhere. You don't get an audition. The goal is to build game-changing relationships with the writers, directors, producers, and casting of the projects that you guys want to be a part of to set up campfires in those offices, to build and maintain those relationships. Again, casting directors don't cast. That's why we want to do this. When you're pitching on a phone, and that's what this is about, it's a phone pitch. Every actor's pitch is going to be different. So when you pick up a phone, or even when you walk into a room for an audition or into a meeting, you have less than half a second for the consumer to either buy it or not buy it. You have to communicate during that half second. What are you? What do you do? What are you about? To do that, you need common sense. One, two, you need to be determined. And three, you need a sense of urgency. Do it now, don't wait, don't delay. It's not your rep's responsibility to figure out that high level branding and marketing, it's yours. And it's very important to distinguish, you see a lot of these workshops in town, discover your niche or your type. Your niche or your type has nothing to do with high level marketing and branding. When you think about your acting niche or your type, it's sort of just what, what pre-existing roles that already are out there would be roles that you could easily fall into or be slotted into. Your high-level branding is how you're going to sell yourself in seconds when you pick up a telephone. So I'm going to read something that is from the first season of Westworld, and it's a master class in marketing and branding. And it came at the end of the first season when one of the chief story designers presented an idea for Anthony Hopkins, who ran the theme park. And Anthony Hopkins, um, he didn't like that idea. He thought it was bullshit. And this was his response um, to a storyline idea that he didn't like. And I considered a masterclass in marketing and branding. And we're going to substitute the word guests for your audience, casting directors, producers, writers, people in a position to give you work. Anthony Hopkins says, no, I'm not interested in this idea. 
It's not about giving the guests what you think they want. The guests don't return for the obvious things we do, the garish things. They come back because of the subtleties, the details. They come back because they discover something they imagine no one had ever noticed before, something they fall in love with. They're not looking for a story that tells them who they are. They already know who they are. They're here because they want a glimpse of who they could be. The only thing your story tells me, Mr. Sizemore, is who you are. And I, I think that quote is amazing. What we're trying to do when pitching ourselves, when essentially selling ourselves, is giving somebody a glimpse of who they could be with us on their team, not telling them a bunch of things that we think is cool about ourselves. So I'm going to read you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to read you this piece on how to start thinking about and distilling value proposition and what value proposition is. And I hope you find it as interesting as I do and my clients have. To launch your career and build game-changing relationships with major industry players, you need to know how you're going to sell yourself when you or your team get on the phone with producers, directors, casting, etc. And this is something that the high-level agents and managers are going to need to know before they agree to rep you. They need to clearly know how they're going to sell you when they got on the phone and pitch you. What are you going to say that cannot be ignored? Something so irresistible that the person on the other end of that conversation says, wow, that sounds awesome. I need someone like you on my team. Please tell me more. To get that wow, you have to show your future collaborators that you understand exactly what they want and deliver it to them in a simple, easily digestible and baggage drama desperation free way. And it's important that you're brief and to the point about it. You guys literally have seconds when pitching to communicate that. And in the business world, it's called value proposition or unique value proposition. It's not even taught at most business schools. It's Harvard Business School and a handful of others that teach it. It's a brief statement that gets to the bottom line of what you're offering why it's useful and why you are the solution to their problem. And it forms the genetic code of all of your future marketing, social media, posts, phone, email, pitches, website, pictures. It's like the DNA of all of your branding marketing infrastructure. That's why it's really important that whether you're an actor or a business, you have this figured out before you do all of that stuff. And most folks make the mistake of not doing this critical work before they invest time, money, and energy in like real and pictures and website and social media. It's important to take the time to fine tune and distill your value proposition. And as I mentioned before, I hate one size fits all approaches and techniques. Um, it's ignorant. It doesn't take into consideration the uniqueness and awesomeness of all your personalities. So everyone is going to be different. So the exercise of fine tuning and sharpening your value proposition is worth a lot of time and thought. It forces you to improve your clarity on key business strategies. Like one, who is your ideal customer? Two, what need are you solving from them? Three, whom are your prospects comparing you to? And what is the number one reason why you should be chosen, you should be hired, you should be cast, we should collaborate with you. Answering the questions, distilling it down to a, concise, to a concise statement is hard and it's overwhelming. It's hard because they're big questions and because they're important questions, but it's worth all the time in the world. Um, it forces you to improve clarity on key business and career strategies like who are you? What do you stand for? Where do you fit in the world? Who are the people who, who are the people you want to work with? Who are the what are the shows? Who are the producers? Who are the writers? Who are the production companies you want to collaborate with this year? 
What needs, what needs are you solving for them? Whom are industry leaders comparing you to? And what is the number one reason why you're the best choice? And yes, I'm going to read those questions again for you slowly right now. Here we go. Who are you? What do you stand for? Where do you fit in the world of this industry? Who are the specific people, projects, production companies that you want to work with? And dream big. No one's judging you. What needs are you solving for them? Whom are industry leaders comparing you to? What is the number one reason why you are the best choice? Distilling it all down to a brief, fun, and impactful statement and seeing instant results is fun and empowering. Celebrity actors are in the same boat as you. Again, as Eugene Simon said, we're going to be welcoming you just a little bit. It doesn't get easier. You just get braver. So stop waiting for permission to do this high level in marketing and brand, to do this high level marketing and branding. Okay, we're going to dive into another part of this right now. I want to talk a little bit and we're going to segue into a conversation with Eugene in a little bit. You're very welcome, Nori. Um, um, I, it was good to repeat that, and I hope you guys were able to write that down or to, you know, maybe replay it in a little bit. I want to talk about acting and how we're using the work that we do to guarantee a win in the audition room. And yes, I mean guarantee a win to as what Eugene has said before, how do you stand out without screaming? That is your job in the audition room to stand out, not to fit in, not to play it safe, not to back off, not to do what everybody else is going to do. Great actors know what great acting feels like. Great actors know the work was great because they feel it, not because they watch playback for half of their acting class. Playback is useful as a tool, but it can be toxic for certain actors to watch themselves because it may develop a preoccupation with a result. What you're watching on a playback is the end result of a chemistry experiment. I want to empower actors to know when their work was great, not to rely on someone to tell them that it was great. Does that make sense? Playback is useful. It's a tool. It's a spice, but it should not be made a fetish out of. And it's a big misuse of time to spend half an acting class watching it um, as it's something that might be toxic for certain actors. Actors like Meryl Streep, Johnny Depp, Reese Witherspoon, Javier Bardem know never to watch themselves because of how harmful it is to them to do that. It may be useful to you. And sometimes it is. If you can get over yourself, if you can get over how you look and watch yourself like an editor would watch yourself, then watching playback can be useful, but only as a tool to see if there's something technically that was going on, but not to know if the acting was good. The number one rule of the audition, I love talking about this. Never guess what you think they are looking for. Assume you are who they are looking for and bring yourself to the piece with a powerful, brave choice. They don't know what they're looking for. If you try to guess what they're looking for, you're just in a mind frame of trying to please somebody, trying to please a casting director, 
And it's like guessing at a needle in a haystack. Remember what I said in the beginning. We're really creating magic by when you get a role, booked role or an audition, you have to let go of the outcome. You have to let go of what you think the role is. You have to reject what I call the obvious choice, the trap. What is every actor going to do? And I'm going to give you guys a really fun kind of dirty little acting secret is that, I don't know if it's dirty, but it's fun. Um, character description, uh, stage directions. Those are not your acting instructions. Those are not for you to obey. Character directions, stage directions, those are not your acting directions. You are not supposed to obey that. They're not to be ignored, but they're not your acting and directions. And you can be sure a lot of places and classes and teachers and actors are making choices based on that. Why are they not your acting instructions? One, they're part of a writer's pitch to pitch the writing, to show production. Here's an example of what this could be. Two, a lot of the character description information is written by casting directors or breakdown services. It has nothing to do with the original piece. It's just to break it down for casting to give character description. So not your acting instructions. And the other thing about great training is that it always has to be dropped and let go of. Meryl Streep talks about this. Drop it and let go. Never bring your acting training or technique um, in an effortful way into the acting. Otherwise the work is gonna reek like acting training. What we're trying to do is plant seeds inside of us, asking a hundred questions, seeds that we can't recover from. And, and it has to be let go of, it has to be freed up. The difference between good and great when making acting choices, the final choice going in after the hundred questions have been asked and answered. And I really do encourage you guys to come to a free audit uh, Thursday night, seven to 1030. You'll get an invite after this and come and watch the process. Um, and at the end of it, the difference between good and great whether you're starring in a Ridley Scott movie or whether you're going into an audition, the difference between good and great is that are you starting your scene, every scene lit up in full instead of empty, cold, having to warm up, ignited, emotionally ignited. And if you start like that and it can be activated in one second in a flash, you don't have to do any more acting. And I call that the hook. And we find that in our work. It's called the hook. We find the hook. It's the thing that gives you instant access to full emotional preparation. Think of it like a body attitude or an emotional opinion that can't be ignored. The hook is the thing that makes it so you don't have to act anymore. It's fantastic. The brave choices, the ones that you didn't think you had permission to do, you guys, those are the ones that are booking. Those are the ones that are going to the next level. Big note we constantly get from production and casting about the acting. I can always bring an actor back. I'll tell you guys, the easiest thing in the world is to get an actor to really talk and really listen. That is the easiest thing in the world. Casting production says it's so easy to pull an actor back to talking and listening, but it was it's impossible to pull out a brave, dangerous choice if they didn't know how to do it or they didn't have the bravery to do it at the beginning of the piece. We have an actor at the studio, Annie Chang, phenomenal actor, multiple series leads, also teaches at the studio. Recently booked a series regular, series lead in J.J. Abrams' new pilot. J.J. Abrams um, personally wrote her, a, wrote her an email because he had personally pushed her through to the network when they were on the fence. And J.J. Abrams said to this actor, thank you for being the one willing to take a risk. That was the reason we didn't need to see anyone else. Your performance was the only actor that I wanted to show Showtime. 
And the risk, the real risk that she did was playing a comedy like a drama and making choices uh, that were related to that. And again, you guys, I can't talk you through every little detail I do with an actor I wanna show you. So I want you to come into a class and watch it. And I'm inviting Eugene on, Eugene Simon in just a little bit to talk about what the process has been like for him as an actor. So you're gonna get, it would be your, ridiculous of me to yammer on about all the things I do with actors. It's way better to show somebody and you're going to get his perspective and you're going to come and watch the work in one of my classes. Here's another phenomenal um, story. Those of you familiar with the show Barry, I believe it's on HBO. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but there was a phenomenal quote from Bill Hader and Alec Berg uh, the producers and star producer of the show, Barry. And Berg was talking about hiring Henry Winkler. And I want you to hear this story because it's very important. It sets the stage for what Eugene and I are going to talk about. So they were talking about how Henry Winkler booked the role of the acting teacher in Barry. And if you haven't seen it yet, you have to see it because the, the show is, is very funny. So Alec Berg said, um, when we cast Henry Winkler as Gene in our show, the character as written was much darker, angrier, more narcissistic. He was just too full of himself. As soon as we saw Henry playing that role, it just utterly changed the whole backstory of the character. What Henry did in that room changed the whole backstory of the character for them because Henry is such a naturally warm and kind person that it was just so much more interesting to see a guy who in acting class is this powerful figure and then clearly in his life, he doesn't have the same control. And we, when he leaves the building, he's just a smaller lost guy. And here's the brilliant thing that he says next. The joy of series television is that thing of you get to cast talented people who put their spin on that and who put their spin on it and then you watch what they do and you go, oh my God, that's not what we had intended at all. It's better. And now we're going to write back to them and they're going to take that and put their spin on it. It's like this great tennis match, he says, where you know if you're listening to each other, you go back and forth and keep elevating the material. And I just, I, I just think that's beautiful. There's a, there's a great... There's a great quote from Deanna Vreeland, former editor of Vogue. And I want to share that with you guys. She said to show people what they didn't know they wanted yet, what they didn't know they wanted yet. You want to go into those auditions and in no way do what you think you're supposed to do. And not only that, in no way do anything like what anyone else is gonna do. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna change the game. You wanna show someone something they didn't know they wanted yet. That's exciting. And Eugene, I am ready to speak with you too. So we are going to, I'm gonna introduce Eugene Simon, and then I'm gonna interact with another human being and it's gonna feel a little bit uh, better than just me talking um, like this. So uh, let me bring Eugene up here. I'm going to do start with that. All right, Eugene, I am going to bring you up. Let's see if I can do that. All right, I'm inviting Eugene onto the screen with me. Eugene, hoping you're ready to be invited onto the screen with me. I am indeed. Eugene Simon, are you there? I am. Lovely to see you, Joseph. It's a pleasure. I cannot to hear you. you yet, Eugene, but maybe, um, let's see. Is there a, I turn my mic off. Now it's on. Yes, Can you hear me now? it's on. I uh, can't hear you now. I'm going to introduce you. I can't hear you now. Let me try. One second. Yeah. Take your time. Um, check your mic, and I'm going to introduce you so folks uh, who don't know you know who you are. But um, 
Let's see here. Can you hear me now? Dun, 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 dun. I think maybe one thing, Eugene, is to can you can you guys hear Eugene? Because I can't hear Eugene yet. How about now? Is that is that better? Hmm. How oh, weird. Let me let me send you away and then bring you back. Let's try that. Okay. All right. The joys and horrors of technology. Okay, here we go. Yes, can you hear me? All right, can we be heard? No, I still can't hear you. Such a bummer. <laughs> Uh, okay. I'll be, I'm going to read some bio <laughs> stuff. And, and it's so interesting is that you guys can hear, but I cannot hear. Isn't that why? That's very strange. One second. Let me try. Let's see. Change camera and mic. Uh, okay. Here we go. Can you hear me now? How about, how about now? Is that is better at all? Can you hear me now? <laughs> well, what I'm going to do. Okay, good. Well, you guys can hear Eugene, and I cannot hear Eugene. That is bizarro. Let's see if I can put my headphones on, and we'll see if we can try to make this work. Eugene, thank you for being here. Of course. And let me go get my iPad. Yes. By the way, hello, everyone. It's nice to see you. We'll be with you in just a second. I'm just going to go and grab my iPad. If you can, tell, if you can let, let Joseph know, that would be great. One moment. You're yeah. going to get your iPad? Yes. Okay, right. so let me disconnect and reconnect. I'll give you a second. Okay, guys, I'm going to set up Eugene. Hopefully, I can hear him, but he's going to be speaking to you guys, and that'll be okay as well, and I can kind of guide the conversation a little bit. So many of you know Eugene from his work on four seasons of Game of Thrones playing Lancel Lannister. Uh, Eugene also recently played Albert Einstein's son, Eduard Einstein, in the National Geographic scripted anthology series Genius. Uh, Jeffrey Rush played Einstein. Uh, Eugene also, uh, he played Jeffrey Rush's son, Einstein's son in, in Genius. Eugene also starred as Sean in The Lodgers, in the feature of The Lodgers. Eugene also starred as Ben Like in the feature Kill Ben Like, for which he recently won Best Actor at the Fantaspoa Film Festival, among many other things Eugene has, has done. And we're gonna try to get him back up, get him back up and running here uh, very shortly. Fantastic. Eugene, I can hear you. Yeah? Is that yeah. Hey. What's up? Oh, <laughs> it was you guys. It was a it was a Chrome compatibility. I had to use Chrome, so we're here. There we go. <laughs> Thank you guys for your patience. It's no, dude. It's so nice to be here. It's really really wonderful to be talking to you. And hello everyone. Thanks for your patience. Good. I'm glad we're uh, we're on. Yay, Chrome. Woohoo! Mm. All right. Thank you, Chris, for troubleshooting. Eugene, thank you so much for spending a little time with us today. Of course, of course. It's just wonderful to be here. It's great to have you here. And um, good, we didn't lose too much time. So I guess, you know, I don't know how much of the conversation that you were you were privy to, but um, I kind of would like to, told people, some people may recognize you. I told, talked a little bit about some of the roles that you were doing. Would just love it if you could maybe tell a little bit of your story, talk a little bit about um, what the work we've done has meant to you and just sort of your journey as an actor. I think one of the um, the original, kind of the things, thing that you said when we first started was, it was like, it's, it's almost like was so, it felt like so hard at first with the acting. It was like, felt kind of like painful and like the feeling that it could be easy and loose was yes. this kind of liberating, terrifying thing, but I'm gonna, I'm yeah. gonna show I just would love you to talk and thank you again for being here. No, of course. Well, thanks for having me. Um, 
You know, I, I, I remember when we had those kind of conversations and I, I remember one of the biggest things about being an actor, which um, it's one of those things that can be so elusive, but it's almost, again, one of those things that is so uh, with us all the time. It's like the idea of being present when we're having a really, really tough time in life. Um, it's this idea of giving oneself permission to just be. And it's this thing that I... Um, it's this thing that takes quite a long time not to learn. It takes a, a, it can take a while to unlearn what you may think is required to give your audience a good performance or to uh, know that you have performed well. Um, and, and one of the things that we started we started learning about, I remember one of the almost one of the lines that you gave me was that wonderful thing that Jeff Bridges said. Which is that you want your diet? You don't want anyone to see the. Uh, you want it to be like a diamond. You don't want anyone to see a single bit of, of a, a single chink in the diamond. What you yeah. want it to be completely foolproof. Like a diamond um, cut. Like a diamond exactly, cut. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that one of the things that working with you has most provided me with, and and one of the things that has allowed me in my own capacity from doing the work that we have done is to see much how I can bring to a performance without having to oh, flagellate myself and go through a process of appalling deconstruction and then reconstruction. As we say, and as I, I'm, I'm so happy to hear, you know, 75% of all roles that we do are already made for us. The 20, And then there's the extra 25% that's... Yeah. Um, that, that we seek out, that we, we pursue. I even say like 90% of the role is the personality of the actor. I would and say so like, too. I would say the percentage is higher. And I agree, and we're not playing ourselves. So those oh. of you that are new, no, we are not playing ourselves. We are figuring out under what conditions would it be possible mm. to do this. We are we are intoxicating ourselves yes, in the exactly. world. Yeah. And, and what, what makes that the, the process of how we work, typically speaking, if we're studying a, a role, whether it's a book role or an audition or it's something that you want to present to a, present in a masterclass or during an audition, yeah. whatever it is, you know, you have permission not to obey the script. I mean, this is something that, totally. you know, we've, we, we've touched upon many, many times, but I've, um, I found that to be so helpful to me because what it what it does for me is it allows me to realize that my journey of exploration into a character is the most intimate and unique one that can possibly happen, and it's more than it, it's 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 almost it's it's closer to me than I ever really realize. It's like that old T. S. Eliot thing: you do all of this work, you do all of this stuff, you go on this huge journey, and then you come back to the place that you were at, and you know it for the first time. Cool. And you sort of know where you're at, and it re, and you discover, and you discover how much of you is already in this, and it's a wonderful thing, and um, yeah, makes the whole performance so much more enjoyable in any respect. But it can um, really, be, it can really be freaky. Like it can be kind of like you have to trust that. What if your best acting felt as easy and loose as if you were playing yourself? Would you trust that it was interesting? It's this existential right. factor, you know? Right. But but this is the thing, and I, I'm just even talking to you now, you, I, you can tell that I want to get up and start doing this stuff. It it's so, but it's great though, it's so contagious. It's it's that's the that's the wonderful thing about it is that when you when you do that kind of work, what you realize is that what you have in the moment, some ideas that you have in the moment, honestly, guys, th this is this is gold that I've learned. Ideas that you have in the moment can be the most vital offering that you can possibly make to the project that you're working on. You can bring something that, as you mentioned, jo uh, Joseph, that, that um, Anthony Hopkins said, something that people, not that people want to see, there's something they know they already are, but something they can imagine they could be. And yeah. I was working on a job recently, and I remember, I remember that this whole scene that I was doing was about a young man who comes and... Um, He's been taken away from his mother and he's been experimented on. And I remember doing it and thinking to myself, okay, well, there's an option to say like, you know, oh God, you know, what's the trap here? You know, oh God, you know, I want my mother, you know, where's, you know, like I'm, I'm tremoring, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. But then there's this other choice that just says to me, oh, wow, I'm on my own now. I'm, you know, if there's a sex, there's, the, there's this opposite side to it. There's this other sexy choice 
that yeah. no one tells you about. There's the sexy choice that no one tells you about. And that, guys, is what the gold of what you can learn in Joseph's class, without question. But you, you need to remember that you can you can find something in your deepest, most extraordinary childishness, childlike place that can make it a genius bit of work. And, and that's just a miracle to understand from, from working together and from working with other actors. It's, it's a glory. Hey, speaking of genius, this is a quote from Einstein. I think you'll like this. I don't know if we, we were working together a couple days ago or last week. He said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. I yes, love it. Yes, yes. You have to be willing to learn how the puzzle pieces go together, to put yep. them all together, the glasses on part, to do the craft, all that, but then you have to be willing to rip the puzzle up from the ground up to see the, 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 the thing that's going on underneath it, you know? Absolutely. That's terrifying for people to do because they, they were trained to execute an intention, an objection, objective, yes. something like what the author suggested, not to do opposite, not to, right? Mm. Yes, no, absolutely. But what that says, that sentence about a constant state of, 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 a, of a, a, an ever expanding state of consciousness is that as you go along in the journey, when you discover something and then you carry on doing the work, yeah. you'll discover things. And in that very process of discovery, you are in a state of becoming, which I believe David Mamet or, or a friend of yours. Uh, 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 Bob, Dylan. Uh, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan always talk about being in this state of, of, of becoming. You are always becoming. Yeah. And every single scene that is occurring on any single script has an underlying state of becoming that it is a joy, guys. That's why acting is so wonderful. It, it should be a, a miracle of creative pleasure to discover what that could be. Yeah. And that, yeah, it, but it really is. It's that the miracle is the word because what you're doing where was I going with that? I, I, I promise you, I, I, I had something there. But oh, I was we're, just, we're just going out into the ether, you and I. And you, you can know. do that, guys. The point is that you can yeah. swan dive into this stuff. You know, that's what that's what I love doing most. Um, I remember I came into the master class and I had to play a terrible character. I mean, just a despicable human being. Um, in um, a, you know, a, 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 just an awful human being, a, a supremacist, a, a horrible maniac. But it ended up not being about all the evil things that you'd think um, a sort of a sort of mass murdering, insane maniac would be about. It ended up being about something completely trivial within the scene. It ended up being about the flight attendant that was walking past me. And yeah. these are the secret relationships in a scene to look for. And Eugene, don't you think? Oh, uh, this is so fun. I'm f fucking glad we got this thing working. Uh, <laughs> don't you think? Uh, Alex Ashinger, one of our other masterclassers, said this: is that. Um, Oh, this is so brilliant. He said, uh, people don't see your choice. He said, oh, stop trying to control what people see. Exactly. People don't see what's going on underneath. That's why exactly. we, we stop being obsessed with the result, with the playback. It's yeah. like we said, great actors know the work was great because it's fun. And you yes. have fun in your bones, yes. fun in your body. Exactly. And you could solve the problem of playing that scene with a choice that's nobody's business. The people don't see it, but it's like, it, it is, it is the opposite version of it. I, I, may I just for a second, or you jump in, jump in. I no, I'm just going to say out. briefly, what you've just said there is the embodiment of freedom. That's the embodiment of freedom. I love that. The it's embodiment. The embodied, but no, but no, but if, if your actor is within my hands right now, if this is the if this is the spirit of the actor right now, what you just talked about is the embodiment of freedom. Because the truth is, guys, no one can read your mind. Yes. No one can read your mind. They don't know what you're thinking. So what does that mean with regards to how much you can get? To, you know how much exactly. You can get to Exactly. And that's, that is why when it comes to the I am one who's when you begin, the I am one who's is something that basically just is a, it's a free form of self-explanation self -explanation into the character, the scene and, and the world. It's part of our work to tune your heartbeat to the character's heartbeat. Well, you can guys can come and watch it. Yeah. It, 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 when that happens, you, you discover that, you know, you're, you're in this space. And the thing is, guys, you think that you've got to go left or right or forward or backward. But the point is that you can suddenly decide I'm just going to go up. 
you can go in any direction. You can, once you've studied the piece and you understand, yeah. you're, you're in a process of self-discovery as much as anything else. And that leads to what's called dangerous acting. And I always, I always used to talk about that Joaquin Phoenix quote about how he, he does, you don't want to, the point of an acting class is not to do something that you're going to recreate somewhere else. Yeah. It's to figure out what the choice is that's going to spark the wildfire yeah. of the piece and it's going to be different every time. So Joaquin Phoenix said that he tells every director that he works with recently that he's actively consciously going to do very bad things with his choices to take pressure off of the piece as if to say, mm -hmm. I don't know what the fuck this piece is going to be. I don't know what this is going to be. Yeah. Um, and it's fun and we have to, and, and, and sometimes actors who are new to this process discover like lightning in a bottle of a choice, but then they say, oh, that's great, but I can't do that in casting, or I could. Yeah. I say you can't afford not to make those kind of choices in casting. Yeah. Can I, it, it's okay, can I just quickly kind of talk a little bit about some of the discovery that we made with Edward, the mm. kind son and genius. Um, there was a moment, and I always like telling this story, Eugene. I'm teaching at uh, SAG After tomorrow, and I always tell this fun story. So uh, Eugene was auditioning for the role uh, in Genius, playing Jeffrey Rush, Einstein's son. And um, the scene, and he was severely depressed, you know, suicidally depressed. And the scene started with Eduard, the audition scene, sitting in a chair after one of the most like worst episodes of depression. He tried to kill himself and it starts in a chair, like with a therapist in the room. I don't know who was the therapist, was it? Carl Jung, it's actually Carl Jung. Carl Jung. Mm. And we, we were talking about it and what kind of the depression. And, and then I said, well, what's the trap? What's the obvious choice? You know, every actor is gonna be sitting there with a shawl, you know, a hundred thousand yard stare, despondent, numb. You know, what, what was the trap? What would you say the trap of that start would be? Well, the trap would be, would be to play someone who is, who, as you say, who is all about, um, who is all about, uh, who, who is all about shock and horror, who is yeah. all about, um, um, well, I'm, I'm not trying to be dis dis dismissive here, but it is all about, um, who is all depressed. Yes. Solely interested in the idea of depression, which if you think about it, guys, is an archetype in itself. Yes. Because we, we, we are all different when we are in stages of depression. You know, yes. it's, 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 you know. And he had just been cold pressure hosed. That's the other thing we failed to mention. Yes. And then I started, we started talking about this and I was asking you, hey, hold on a second. You were cold pressure hosed after trying to kill yourself. Let me ask you something perverse. Did it work? And, and the moment you are, said it, yeah, the moment you said crazy. it, I was just like, yeah. And then you said, yeah. yeah. And then you said, I kind of feel, is that how do you feel? And you said, liberated. Yeah. And it there feels was good. Good, right? Yeah, it feels good. And it feels like I'm back in control now. I mean, right now, guys, I can feel it. I can feel, it feels good. Yeah. And it feels like I'm right back in control. And I've got Carl Jung behind me. Yeah. But I'm the one who is in the control here. I'm not the one who's, I'm not that. I'm in control here. And I, I, I honestly, that was the most enjoyable day of filming possibly yeah. I've ever done. I just loved it. And what happened that Lizzie, I can just see Lizzie's asking a question. This this links back in is Yeah, I see Lizzie's what question. we what we found there the answer, which please. has can be can be different in different scenes, but we found the secret relationship in the scene. It's not necessarily a relationship to someone or something, but it's almost like it's it's a dirty secret that's under the bed, but it's also the best thing about the entire moment. What's under the sheets? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Under the, but the yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's really, really uh, a pleasure because what then happens, guys, is that you stop acting because you're now in the pursuit of your own fun and euphoria. And you, you, maybe many actors ask themselves, how on earth do, do, do Robert, how does Robert De Niro do it? I don't understand. How, how does, how do they do it? How, how do they do it?
No and action whatsoever. It's all no been acting. before and it's let go. Exactly. And then what happens is you cease to be acting and you become, as I put it rather badly, but you become a happening. You're just a happening. Oh, I You're love happening. you describe that, that happening. Yeah. You become a happening. It's I, a, it becomes a noun. You're, you're no longer doing anything, guys. You are a thing. You're a happening. And that is joyous. Now, may I just say one of the oh, things that I, one of the things I think is so important is uh, a, a lot of people don't really understand kind of actors that do that, except the ones who end up, shall, shall we say, be incredibly well known. I mean, I, I for one, I well, you know you watch Daniel Day Lewis and you, wow, 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 how and wow, how and wow. But when he does it, you think to yourself that he's having an experience that constantly, every time someone says someone says action it's not even really about the action he's in a state of becoming because yeah. as you because he because just before steven spielberg says action someone could drop the boom and hit you in the head by accident or the, the stage might rickety slightly and you might might fall to the side but the point is that it's not like oh that happened i now have to reset right, it's no. not that your your mind like when you go to the shops and like when i'm talking to you all right now is still just happening and processing and whatever take happens from them becomes a, one of the many many various ways that you can present the scene and it becomes good it's good it's real and you've earned the right now to not have to do anything because you're filled i'll sometimes call it filled nothing so yes your best acting after you start acting you're not doing anything it's blank canvas you don't know what i don't know what you're going to do you don't know what i'm going to do but i am starting lit up yeah flames. yeah Build up on something instead of nothing. Yeah, I like I like the way you describe that happening. Now, scene study, it's the same thing. I think some classes make a fetish again out of like scene study. It's all scene study. The way we do it in class is that you shouldn't be working on a piece in the bubble of an acting class. When you work on a piece in class, it's very important that you state the context. So mm, the bubble of a class. So I'll ask the actors, what are you working on? How do you want to work on it? A scene study piece. There's like 15 different ways of auditioning. So I want to do it as a pre-read, a video audition, a callback, a table, yeah. read, which is still an audition in a way. So it's very important that you state it. This is what we're talking about is the same work. And again, there's 99 questions and everyone's going to be a little different. It's the same work we're going to do if you book the lead in a Ridley Scott movie, which one of our clients did versus you know, do a co-star, guest star audition for a single camera sitcom. It's all the same work. You wanna, in an audition, show a production team what they're gonna get on set, and then that scene study. So mm. we're, you know, we're just getting real about some, you know, some things here. Sure. Um, yeah, and then, you know, how do you know it's right? Is it, we get this a lot with the auditors in class because sometimes we'll find like 12 great choices that work, or five. The right choice is the one that feels is the most fun for you. Never yeah. the one you think someone else is going to like, uh, you know, yeah. all that. So, yeah, I think um, what do you, if there's like one thing that you kind of like hold dear, you know, when you're working on a piece, Eugene, like, what do you think is one of the more most sort of valuable tools that you have in your in your you know, arsenal? Well, I mean, after after doing the work for such a long time, one of the things that I most connect with is the idea of um, maybe doing. I, I I don't think doing nothing is really our sent. That's really the sentence here. I I I, I like the idea. Maybe it's a, maybe it's too too much of an oversimplification. Because, because actors can take this the wrong way and ego mm. can play it. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I, ego is the enemy of art. It really is. Um, just as self is the enemy of spirit. The, the, the ego is not what we're here for. But I think that you have to start a process of believing that you know, for, you, you know best, you, you, you know what's best and you're willing to go down the rabbit hole. One of the things I love is is sort of letting is is letting go of the outcome in a way in, is, is letting go of, of the outcome and and but the, and the, but the thing that actors always feel is they go into this kind of danger zone but the point is that what I will encourage everyone listening to this to do if you are with Joseph or if you're rehearsing in your own sense is 
just try to go into the danger zone, guys, because for, for a little bit. It's just something a little giggly, some playroom acting, because what will happen is that you'll discover something that you can connect with and enjoy. And yeah. you need that as an actor, because we all know how many pressures there are. You need to think, you know, we all think we've got to impress the casting director. Yeah. We may about external things. But really, it's part of us liberating ourselves. It's, it's liberating ourselves so that when you go into the room, you, as you, as Lizzie, as Mara, as Marcus, as Nori, as William, as Roxanne, as Michael, when you go into the room, you don't really have much of a massive transition between what the character's got to do when you start recording and the personality that's going to charm them. Yeah. But, but you, you, you'll just activate it, guys, and that's when the hook comes in. So, so the hook... The hook can light you up in five seconds. I yeah. just did yeah. where the hook into a scene was me literally having to just go, I won't see, I won't yell it, but yelling out, where is my mother? I just had to scream it. I had to, to light myself up. And then the scene became about something very different. Thank but you. I knew I, I knew I wanted my mum. And the rest just told itself, guys. The rest told itself. So could we say the rubber meet the road meets the road of this after doing some of the craft work that we do that to be responsible mm -hmm. as we're sort of um, like exploring the character, bringing it up through us is let go of what's going on on the page. Don't expect everything in the page to mean something to you and don't mm -hmm. force it to mean something. Mm -hmm. I want to know who you are outside of the scene. I want to talk about yourself. Get off the script for a second. You got to be willing to embrace a certain sort of element of chaos yes, in order yes. to bring something, you know, another dimension into it. Yes. So stop talking about the piece. Uh, yeah. It's really huge. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There is one other thing to that, which is very important to highlight, which is, which is uh, when you begin the process of looking at a piece of work, whether it's a, a particular scene or a, or, a, or a large script or whatever it is, when you when you have the lines in front of you, I know this to be true for myself. The way you learn the lines best is not by learning the words. It's not words that resonate with us. It's meaning that resonates with us. And when you go through the process, I mean, you know, you can learn them as well. But the word, the, the, the language and the vocabulary will come to you as you do start start reading it through. And literally, as you've got this this script in your hand as you're doing the work, as you're literally reading it through, getting a picture of it, you, you, you start to almost hear the song of the piece and you end up basically naturally kind of falling into it. And you start off with your own I am one who's. You, if you have a short, especially if you've got a short piece, you've got something that's two or three pages. I, I love it when I get an audition where it's just a three page scene and not the whole episode. I yeah. personally love it because what the what casting director has said or they know is, is, Friday. Yeah. is go play, go fucking, sorry, beg your pardon, go play. And that will get you back in the room guys. And if it, and if it doesn't get you back in the room, it'll impress them. And it'll, on top of impressing them, you'll have fun. You'll enjoy the, you'll enjoy the event of acting, which is, not something I think actually a lot of actors do. I agree. I, I, I don't think many actors really know how fun how fun this can this can be, and also have it be bull bullseye brilliant. You know. Yeah, I think I think there's all these painful parts of this process, and every part of it can and should be fun. Uh, yeah. Hundred percent. No go writing some painful backstory exercise in a corner. Have it mm. out loud. Talk it out loud. Find emotionally supercharged language, attitude language. Yeah, it, getting a three-page scene is fun, not a 16-pager on a Friday, right? No. Right. No rage <laughs> taping. No rage taping, yeah. Rage taping became something, yeah. <laughs> uh, the last thing I would just love it if you could talk about, and then we'll, um, we're so, I mean, it's going by so fast, is Eugene, talk about the importance of an accountability group for actors. It's something that you, you couldn't, you know, it, you had a lot to say about it before. I'd love your thoughts on just actor accountability groups in general. I um, I find it to be um, when you're at, when you have an actor accountability group before you start into any bit of work that you're going to do or any any in any, in any way in any in any way you just call up that and you just say how you're feeling 
a community, let's just also state, this is a community of actors, whether it's your class, which we do in our classes, but a community of actors who check in regularly to talk about their failures, successes, triumph, anything and everything. And you know, that's what we're talking about here. You bring your feelings into the room with actors and you talk about how things are going. You talk about what you think and how you're feeling about failures, successes, uh, up and coming projects, dilemmas, and all this sort of stuff. And the thing is that you start to get such release, guys, because you, you realize that everyone is afraid. Everyone you will ever meet, director, producer, casting director, they're all scared in their own way. Casting director's got to respond, got to, got to report to the producer, producer's direct, it's all in, interwoven. And I find that it allows me to, to think far more clearly, guys. You can't do this on your own. Don't do it on your own. It's not, it's not, um, it's not worth it, guys. It's not, it's not lovely enough. It's having yeah. a community of actors reminds you, teaches you, trains you to work with other actors and know how they're feeling, but also for you to treat the craft of acting as not something that has to be. You don't have to suffer unnecessarily, guys. You don't have to be resentful. You don't have to be aching and biting and angry and upset and, and, and anxious. You don't need that. Yeah. Um, it, it, it can be talked about and overcome and your wisdom will grow. So have an accountability group, guys. Send out a message on WhatsApp or Slack to people. Just say, hey, friends, I want to set this up because I want us to talk about how we're doing, how we're feeling. And like a good take that a director sees, a good friend that an actor finds, a good colleague that an actor really finds. It's magic. So keep Thanks. that, guys. It helps so much. And I think that also uh, that also translates to the first time you get up and present a scene, whether it's in your class, on set, or in an audition, should never be the first time you read it with another person. Yeah. Like, we're, yes, experiencing technological issues um, earlier, but, like, how easy is it to get on to – you know, FaceTime, Facebook chat, uh, Skype, Zoom, and like just take five minutes or 10 minutes to like work through something with another person. That's also, you know, part of the act. I have taped in the way you and I are currently talking right now multiple times with friends in LA. It's what, it's a, it's a, it's a joy. It really is. And it's a blessing of technology. Steve was talking about the time difference. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. Steve, yeah. God damn it, Eugene. <laughs> Eugene, thank you so much for like, you know, sharing with us today and taking some Thank time you. to do this and being patient for with the Chrome Safari, God Almighty. Thank you so much for no, of course, of course. And uh, thank you to thank you to you, Joseph, for continuing to do this work and for continuing to um, to teach people the philosophies of acting there because there are deep philosophies here. It's so um, no, I really believe that I, I really really believe it. I don't think the book has yet been written on the philosophies. That can undercurrent acting and that are really can undercurrent that are undercurrents to acting that are so joyous. Um, so thank you for that and thank you for your friendship and thank you to everyone who's who's currently listening to this. I hope to meet you sometime. So oh, sweet, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eugene. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Is it like evening there now? It looks still. It yep. is. It's nine thirty. I'm going to go watch Stranger Things. Enjoy. Can't wait to work with you soon. And thank you, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, guys. God bless. Take care, everybody. Take care, Eugene. Bye-bye. You guys, um, Eugene, thank you very, very much again for that. Um, Destiny, thank you for, for thanking Eugene. I want to I, I wanna be available right now just for some minutes, not too long, because we, you know, we, we sort of have a limit to this conversation on Crowdcast right now. But I'd like to see, you guys have any questions? If you can put them in the chat. If you have some questions, I'm going to take a stab at some of your questions just for, you know, maybe five to ten minutes. Um, so throw them at. I, I can't tell you there is so much to talk about, but there's even more to show you guys. I want you to come and watch the work. Uh, I know, uh, you know, Nori, you're a part of the work every week, as are a lot of other folks here as well. But if you're not, come and watch. It's free. Come and see what we're doing because we can only – talk about so many things. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, this is, this is great. All right. So 
contact information for folks can be gotten anywhere. IMDb Pro, Google. It's very important that it's very important to like you are not directly reaching out to these people. There's proper channels. We're connecting to people through their reps, through their agents, through their production companies, executive producer assistants. Um, I encourage you, those of you that have questions about what are you saying, I have an interview for free. It's an uh, online webinar on the website. If you need, it should be under Launch Your Career Program. It's the full program I do one-on-one -on -one with actors. But it's a free video, and I'm talking with Lara Peza, who's an actor I've been working with for almost 10 years. She's booked about 18 major roles in the last year with no reps, and she's talking about what that, what that pitching is. I encourage you guys to watch it. It's free on the website. If you can't find it, send an email to Chris, our wonderful studio manager at ASST, at josephperlman.com, and they'll send you to where that video is because it goes into, um, it's sort of an extension of what we're talking about today. It's gonna give you even more content. Um, let's see. Best advice for contacting writers, producers without representation. There's a show I wanna be in, but I'm not sure what the best method is. Okay, so where, does the, where do we start? Um, Let's see, what's the best way to get the contact information? Great, many different sources. Um, it's all gettable, so where do you start? You ask yourself, what are the production companies? Who are the writers and directors and producers I wanna work, on, work with? Um, let's pick a show like Stranger Things, okay? There's gonna be many executive producers, a couple writers, you're looking for the showrunners, the creators, the co-creators, the person that writes, directs, and produces it, okay? There might be a couple of those executive producers or creators. Each one of those people has an office in the production office with an assistant. Each one of those people has an agent and or a manager. There are multiple calls for each person that's connected to a production company. So. When I mentioned to you that one of the great reps that I work with makes hundreds of calls a week and it takes 20 phone calls to secure a high level audition, these are phone calls to the executive producers, the writers, the showrunners, the directors. So you pick a show, whatever that show is, or a film or a production company, let's say they produced a movie that you like and you wanna be in their next project, you're trying to target the people at the executive producers, the creators, the showrunners, and you're trying to target the right people. You're not trying to go after them directly. You're, like I said, reaching out to their agents, to their managers, to their assistants, but you need to know, you need to know what you're gonna say, and that's why I encourage you guys to watch that video I did with Laura, or come into a free audit, or take the Launch Your Career program, because. This isn't a one-size-fits-all conversation. What Nori's gonna say is different than what Charles is gonna say, is different than what Brad is gonna say. Everybody's is different. But Laura talks about the fact that you have seconds to communicate who you are as a human being and your value to them, your core value. Um, and we go deep into it, and everyone's is gonna be quite different. Okay, here we go. So, do you have, do you, have to move to LA or New York before you start making those calls. Nope, you can do this from anywhere in the world. You can do it from here, you can do it from Boston, from Dubai, from London, it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you are at your Olympic best as an actor. It's very easy to make these phone calls, it's 30 to 60 seconds for these phone calls. But you have to be great. You have to be great because when you get these opportunities, um, for meetings or for an audition, um, you need to be at your Olympic best. And the other thing about these phone calls is you don't want anything. The phone call is like you're calling as a colleague to a colleague. It's like, I don't want anything from you. I am calling as a colleague, introducing myself to you to collaborate for a future project. That's kind of the gist of the call. Everyone's, like I said, is different. It's not about you wanting someone. No one wants to, be on the phone or in a room with someone that wants something from another person. Anybody can take Launch Your Career program, 
but you're going to be empowered to sort of know how to build those relationships and pitch yourself, but you shouldn't take action until you're ready to deliver on your best acting. So like I said, there's like a whole video. It's probably about an hour long. It is a dialogue with me and a client about the process of pitching and calling. It is free on the website under Launch Your Career Program. And Chris can, Chris can point you to that. Um, how much of yourself do you bring into the room without compromising the character? Well, that's a good question. When you're acting, you're acting. You're not playing yourself when you're acting. But when you walk in the room, the idea of compromising the character is it's don't worry about it. That's not a real thing. You need to bring in who you are as a person because people need to see who they're going to be working with for six to eight years or a year. Does that make sense? So it's like, yeah, no, I wouldn't worry about that at all. I think if someone doesn't get a sense of who you are when you walk in the room, that's a big problem. So don't, I would just say, don't worry about that. It's a, it's, it's kind of a non thing. Um, let me also talk a little bit about the sort of rubber meets the road of this. When you're building relationships with executive producers or writers or directors or casting directors through the appropriate channels, we're building those relationships, not because we want something in the immediate, we're setting up a campfire in those offices to be known to those people. And every two to three months, you're gonna check in with those people and get information. You're getting information about where they're at uh, in the process. Are they gearing up for a new production? Are you gearing up for a new season of Stranger Things? And as you get more and more familiar with those people in the production office, um, through the reps, you're gonna be able to ask for advanced copies of scripts. That's what we're doing in a lot of the classes. The actors are getting access to advanced copies of scripts where they're able to choose the pieces that they feel best suited to, put it on tape, and send it directly to production miles before it ever gets to a casting office. So, so kind of like that's the long game of what we're trying to do. And then when something is currently casting, you're able to actually pick up the phone and pitch yourself to casting on the support of a relationship with the people who've hired the casting director to do the, you know, to cast the project. It's, it's a whole other level um, of playing the game. Let's see. I do. I teach. It's the work is one on one. I do the launch your career work via video session. I also do it in person. It's exactly what I teach. We come up with maybe 20 different versions of phone dialogue, multiple emails for every possible situation. Are there any business development managers for handling this work of pitching with all these executives? I know agents and managers are supposed to do this kind of work, but they have too much going on with so many actors. So can we hire any develop business development manager? Good question. Uh, whose job every day is to meet these executives. I would say, this person is going to be either a publicist, which can get very expensive, but is going to be a really high qualified, great agent or manager. And you can't get someone like that until you've done this for yourself and amassed a certain amount of clout and credits to be able to have a team that's going to help you do it. And I'll tell you something also, the best agency or management company, and and a manager can be more helpful than an agent as an actor is uh, starting to get traction. The best management company in the world is going to maybe get like 30% of everything that's out there for you. It's still your job. And it's always the actor's job to go out there and get it and do it for yourself. To go out there. Here's an example. The actors that have those 1% reps, those phenomenal reps, it's still their responsibility to build and maintain relationships with great writers, directors, and producers, bring those to their reps, to let the reps know that they now have a green light to reach out to those people, okay? I'm gonna read, uh, the last thing I'm gonna share with you is a letter from one of my favorite people. Her name is Sarah Jackson. Uh, she owns one of the probably the best management company in the industry, Seven Summits Pictures and Management. 
And it speaks to what great representation should look, should look like. And it's what actors should be doing on their own until they have that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you. She said, and this is something she wrote for, for the clients at the studio, uh, for the people that we work with. She said, I'm in a fortunate position of having my own business. For me, that's been everything. In the same way that I get to hire people that I admire, trust, and believe in, I also get to choose what actors I work with. I don't work with anyone whose work I don't at some level absolutely believe in, and I don't work with anyone I don't personally like. Sometimes relationships don't develop or work out in the way I had hoped, but that's in every aspect of life. This is where it gets interesting. She says, this is a tough job. You have to make hundreds of phone calls for clients, and you're lucky if one in 20 pans out to an appointment, and then maybe one in 100 appointments lands a job. This is for a celebrity level manager. She said, it's hard to wake up in the morning and continue to do that for people you don't like, and impossible for someone whose work doesn't inspire you. Thank you very much, Abraham. That's how I feel. I realize that's not much help, but I do think you have to work on it. And she said, here are some of her pet peeves, and this is what you can do that would be useful. She said, don't go weeks without calling your reps, but don't call daily for a 20 minute conversation. A friendly reminder to a manager goes something like this. Hey, just to remind you, my friend Dave is directing X movie and I see it's casting now is useful. As is, just a reminder, you sent me on that great project X a few weeks ago. The casting director said I was awesome, but they needed a name. I see she's now doing X and that sounds like it could be right for me is useful. Also, hey Sarah, a reminder, I'm friends with X writer and I hear she's now directing a pilot I'm right for is useful. What's not useful is X casting director is looking for a 30 year old Indian lady. What, not communicating as to why you don't like something in our passing, being late or unprepared for auditions. And why are these not useful? Because it doesn't tell her about the relationships that you have with these people, okay? You're bringing something to the table with your reps by letting them know the people that you have relationships that you've, um, that you've built. Please come to a free audit, see this work, watch actors like Nori and Eugene, get a workout, have a breakthrough, a transformation every single time they get up and work. Every single time they get up and work. Please be our guest and come and watch. It's Thursdays at 7 p.m. Uh, Chris will be sending you an email. Should you uh, be a SAG After Conservatory member, I will be teaching at SAG After Summer Conservatory tomorrow. Should you want to do the Launch Your Career program with me uh, to learn how to specifically craft your pitch, your phone pitch, and your email dialogue to compete for every role that you're right for, not to let something that's for you go by you, please reach out to us. I would be, would be very happy to work with you guys. Um, went over a little bit. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, for spending your Friday afternoon doing this, for you know dealing with the minutes of technical issues we were having. I'm so happy that we were able to have this conversation with Eugene. You're so welcome, Nori. You're so welcome, Mara. Um, I love doing this. I like separating the sort of you know bullshit from the facts of what's going on. Uh, it's never about me. It's about you guys getting to your Olympic best and finding your own path, whether it's the career work, whether it's the acting. There's never a one-size-fits-all approach to that, approach to this work, either career or acting. It's irresponsible. Rosalie, I look forward to learning uh, more about you and to working with you as well, Roxanne. Uh, thank you guys so very much. Have a beautiful, blessed weekend. And if you have any questions about anything that we do, uh, please reach out. Uh, via email. Thank you, guys.